7 y 1 minuto. It's 7 and 1 minute. Algunas libertades en la organización. So, Vamos. In our organization, let's come back little by little. El back to normalness. Y and la sesión sobre todo porque puede ser que algunas personas And then we'll take the session because there's some people that are coming in. Interpreters esperamos que hayan descansado. So the interpreters, we hope that they rested. That they enjoyed the movie. We're going to actually ask for these videos because this Congress is very lively and it was very fun. So how does the second part continue? Well, I think that this has helped us to actually live and when we think that we can do things differently, some of the things that we can do differently were actually about speaking less and moving a lot more. Aunque, aunque. Even though we hadn't really planned this at this particular moment, it was very improvised. That's the risk of allowing Ruben to share his screen. That's the risk. Pero, pero encaja perfectamente But con, con, con. it actually fit in perfectly with many of the things that we have spoken about when we thought about new congresses. No, we always hablar. only speak. Obviously, we have to speak but we also have to express ourselves in different fashions. And I'm sure that this has really recharged our energy. And especially for those of you, or those of us that it's 11 p.m. at night, that was very important to be able to move a little bit. So, well, the idea now is to, I don't know, um, after what our colleagues start to share and Any questions or any questions that the audience may have, let's have a brief debate about social change and community psychology, social change, and related to COVID as well, which is an issue which is recently incorporated due to the situation we're all going through the impact of COVID on community life, on community work, on community relations. So we do have a system when we have a meeting and everybody wants somebody wants to talk you try to raise your hand in the camera so that we know exactly that you want to participate and we'll give you the microphone that's a bit of the idea and you can speak in english or spanish or in portuguese <laughs> portuguese and spanish in brazil <laughs> we, if we can't speak Spanish, we can speak uh, Porto Spanish. Portuñol. Ruben wants to say something. Go ahead, Ruben. Hi. Boys and girls. It's an emotional moment. I almost wanted to cry, I wanted to laugh, I wanted to smile. I was filled with emotions, really. That we're here in this wall, this wall, which is a screen, really. And from that point, how we build community, how we make all of this that we're doing make sense, To continue to accompany people and the groups and the communities and the collective groups that we are accompanying. I'm not sure what's happening in your countries, but in ours, we have a tremendous gap in terms of digital uh, li literacy that people at their homes, as soon as they stopped on-site training or physical meetings, We had to reinvent ourselves continuously to continue to build those bonds with those people and with those collective groups which habitually we used to meet with. And we're doing this, we're navigating this uncertainty, this explosion of uncertainty that requires that we be creative continuously with the ways in which we connect with people. And I'm not sure what's happening in your environments, but here we have many mental health issues that are about to explode. We have many, many people that are about to explode and probably I'm included amongst those people. 
efectos de that all of these effects all these policies related to public health that actually hope to prevent Hidrogenesis. infections they have an actual negative effect and they provoke poor mental health ¿Cómo lo vamos a and manejar? how are we going to deal with all of this in this community type of work that we're accompanying all of us that are here y con esto, lo que, lo que and que with voy, this what i'm trying to conclude with or what i'm getting at is in what way can community psychology or those of us that want to look at it from that perspective it, Perhaps, how can we reinvent this context to help with this explosion of uncertainty and of tremendous challenges that we have with those communities that we used to accompany? Because everything is going to be aggravated and nothing more. I'm actually very emotional. I see the lights, I see your faces, I say, wow. Nothing more. That was my contribution. Gracias, Rubén. Thank you, Ruben. Jorgelina? Well, I was about to cry, I mean, because this was to, to share those emotions associated with, with uh, the things that are generated. So I was thinking a couple of things, and, and, and this is based on what Ruben just said. A part, this is part of the work, I mean, of the community work doing intervention, yeah, investigation, education, and it has to do with meeting, uh, because we're meeting all the time. I mean, we meet with the community, the meeting uh, meets uh, uh, a certain right, that the meeting on our part with other colleagues, and and that, that's uh, when the en encounter, meeting somebody became dangerous, not just dangerous in terms of, of COVID, because, as uh, Ruben mentioned, all the different measures of, of protection imply de-meeting or, or uh, separating. But uh, meeting in virtuality, it's, uh, we're talking about privileges and, and something that I was mentioning before is how is it uh, that we can produce social change and, and it has to do with building those privileges. Apart from the, that, in order, in order to, for you to uh, do a social change, it's meeting and you cannot. And this involves gaps and, and, it, and it depends on the, different, the differences. So I have no answers. I, and I think that in that case, this requires the, the, the reinvention of the community because going back to, to, uh, uh, to the social meetings, that's going to be different. And um, although, and diversity in the places where we are, we know that a lot of people are not following the same activities, others do. There are others who were um, having personal meetings within the pandemics where the communities or the groups are the ones that built some of the responses with respect to the state or being isolated in the public space because some of us have our, our homes and, and there are many people who have uh, seen their poverty increase. So uh, it made a lot of sense, uh, the presentation of James and, and Ellen to, to indicate uh, that the poverty and inequality increase. For those of us working in this field, this may not be novel because this is something that we have been looking into, uh, violence and poverty, trying to create something different. So I think this is something that Nelly mentioned that in another Colombian um, a friend said something, said something uh, Sandra Estrada was here and she's been working on this in Mexico. So. So that's, those are the questions that, that I've raised myself. There are many, many forms of violence which became worse and we are trying to, to tear them apart or to reduce them somehow. And our core tool to reduce them is, is to meet and, and this is something that we cannot do. So this is some food for thought. I wanted to pass the floor to Alicia and Jenny. Well, who will, well, I'll do first, I'll go first. Good afternoon in Uruguay. It's, it's, uh, 
7.10 p.m. Very pleased to meet with you, even if it's virtually. I, I must say, it is very difficult to, to give you some responses within this context, but it is not about the creating or building those responses, but which are the questions that we need to ask ourselves at this time? And um, I wanted to mention, uh, first, there's an association that indicates uh, that Nelly uh, spoke very um, accurately in terms of the in terms of the uh, concept of community, um, and it's about the desire of being together. And uh, then I noticed after paying attention to her, after after hearing uh, Rodrigo and and James, that says you can you you establish theories about community, and that's when Rodrigo was emphasizing on the different concepts about the relation of between the subject and society. This is something that has been there, uh, that has been uh, strongly discussed. So we can normally say that we cannot think of ourselves if we're not related to others. This pandemic, if there is something that is becoming more and more evident are the relations of interdependency. Those are the interdependence relations apart from the fact that the inequalities are, are extremely uh, unequal apart from the differences and the situations that are leading us to being interdependent. But these are aspects, these are like the, the concepts or the conceptualization that we're establishing with respect to the foundation as to why we need to think as a collective or a community group. And, um, and I connected this uh, to the desire, which is a different dimension. What is uh, leading us to, to be uh, to, with somebody else? So the situation uh, is something that the, 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 w the way of communication or uh, moving our bodies or dancing where we are, when we have been sitting here for hours. So what is, what is it that is uh, leading us to, to be with somebody else, with other people? So this, according to what Jorgelina was mentioned in one of the things that, that is actually getting, getting me to think is, is that what's, what in your desire to be with, somebody, with other people, I think that the care or the protection, the self-protection is, is giving, gaining more relevance. So I think that there's a construction of, of care individually you protect me and I protect you. So if, you, if I protect you, you will protect me. So there's a construction of the concept of uh, care and there's, a, there's a, um, a moral care also. This is something that was uh, mentioned by, by um, Jorgelina. And um, to protect the other, uh, you can generate uh, practices of violence against others. So some people may have uh, more rights to being protected compared to others. So I think that there's a huge challenge in place and that has to do with the construction of, uh, of forms of uh, mutual care, uh, uh, self-managed, and uh, we can argue about the different uh, states. Uh, this is something that was raised by, by Rodrigo. Forms of a construction of mutual self-managed uh, care, which not only involve the, the care of uh, human relations or, or, the, or your relation with nature, with uh, the non-human things, because, because this is what we have noticed with the pandemic. So we are invite, invite, we're inviting you to, to think about the, the, the care sense uh, within the situation that we're going through. Thank you, Alicia. Jenny? Thank you, Alicia. I love that what you just said. I think it was thing, I was going, I was following the same lines. I wanna, I wanted to um, 
bring to the conversation the imagination and creativity that the communities that have not been protected uh, to follow your your same line but the state which have not been protected but they which have been strongly affected or uh, and also the communities where from the inequality and racism violence they they have been forced to create a a commu a different uh, sense of community which operates up, uh, outside uh, of the sense of a collective or nation which is not including them and which lead to acts of violence to to murder to delete the memoirs and and to not obtain the truth of those communities so what is curious for me and and it makes me excited is to focus on resilience on the strength of uh, how can we learn uh, from those communities which uh, already know how to operate outside the systems and how to operate in a regular crisis where uh, from a sense of privilege where we have a house we have a, a, a job we have the opportunity to sit down and think to to study to create our theories so I think uh, I think that the privilege, the the from the privilege that we have, at times we may forget that we can be in communities and we can build a collective identity that goes beyond the institutions where we operate at. And I think uh, the the Minga, uh, the the indigenous um, protest and the peace processes that they have been going through in Colombia, which. Uh, which have been created against any armed actor with the com with the peace uh, processes as indicated by them, which are the Afro-Colombian. In Colombia, we have a racism problem, just like in Latin America. And I think that uh, from the US perspective, they're giving us a lot of uh, perspectives as to how to speak when we refer to a community. We're talking about a national Colombian community, but in general terms, we're talking, we're talking about the multiple cultural diversity but we do not refer to racism and um, we're not referring to uh, the ways how within diversity we are also affecting the rights of many people so i think that uh, to wrap up i think that the relations uh, of the indigenous or aboriginal communities or our relations with the environment with nature but the rivers in colombia um one of the rivers i forgot the name right now i don't know if some of my colombian friends they they were a, a river was granted rights uh, there's an, a new fighter struggle in new zealand with the maoris they have shown us how to have a relation with nature which is not only it is not that just to go to the river and have fun, and having fun, but this is a relation in terms of how to overcome those collective crisis times, how to become psychologically stronger when we focus our relation with the animals and nature, with water, with rivers, in such a way that the nature will teach us that they will actually become our 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 instructors it's not a place for you go where you go to for leisure and and these are the things that that uh, you need as a human being and this is something that i wanted to to bring along uh, mother earth uh, the teaching of it i think uh, it, this is very important in our role as psychologists Thank you, Jenny. for those of you that don't have your camera on and you want to participate and you don't want to turn on your camera for whatever reason, please let us know via chat or you can speak and we can let you to speak it. But let me tell you a little, a few things as well that sound a bit uh, related to what we're talking about or aligned to what Alicia and Jenny were talking about, about the issue of caring. And we have tried, or last semester, where we're in the middle of the course and all of a sudden they sent us home with a message that we were gonna come back in 15 days. And that turned into three months and we stayed at home indefinitely and we had to adapt to a new means to relate to our students. And 
from the very first day the institution no but we yes had it clear that what was fundamental was having our relationships in our center of things to get involved with our students in this new way and build these relationships and try to see how we can still take care of our relationships sometimes the university would tell us look continue like if everything was okay at home like if everything was normal and nothing was happening outside of our homes and well it has been a very beautiful process actually in fact of learning to put uh, care and relationships in the center of everything so amongst all of us we actually will come forth with well-being another idea that i wanted to share is that even though the, i think community psychologists and i've always seen it this in this fashion we have to be optimistic we have to always see the glass half full so in our context something has happened which via the different or one of the reactions to the pandemic or covid has been an increase in solidarity we live in a context that for us is a very individualistic concept and makes you an individualistic person because we live in a modern large city and we're only worried about ourselves as individuals and maximum with your family alone and in that context we have seen like how neighbors, anonymous neighbors that had never probably before ever participated in any community sort of livelihood or event started to take care of their neighbors and began to help people that for whatever reason they could not leave their homes or they had some sort of problem. And that has actually happened. So that actually gives me quite a bit of hope that despite that we're going in a world, that we're living in a world that tends to be individualistic and is heading in that fashion, even though unfortunately we had to go, we had to go through severe situations to come back to the solidarity that we had lost in the past. At least that's one positive thing that we're living at this moment. Ruben, you wanted to say something else? Carolyn, you haven't spoken, so Carolyn. Yep, thank you. Um Carolyn from Manchester in England and it's half past ten in the evening. Um, I agree with what Moise has just said in terms of increased solidarity but certainly our experience here is that's very variable. That the pandemic has exposed all the social schisms that existed before the pandemic and it exaggerated them. So all the inequalities that are endemic in our society have been exposed. And I think the solidarity has been um, bounded by identities and um, opportunities. Um, I don't think there's cross-class solidarity. I don't think there's solidarity between those who have the wealth and the opportunity and the possibilities to do well in the pandemic have solidarity with those who are losing their jobs they might feel sorry for them i don't see any any indication of solidarity having said that i do think that from a community psychological perspective we need to be thinking about how we can build common sense of purpose. One of the things that contributes to um, people's anxieties and, and struggles with the pandemic is um, lack of purpose, pointlessness. In, in Manchester, we have had been locked down from March to June and again from July to now. So we've had three weeks of not being locked down. So people are very fragile about what is the point of everything. And that leaves an opening for the populist freedom fighters supporting liberal freedom and democracy. And I'm saying this with sarcastic emphasis to exploit 
people's fears and anxieties. So we're seeing a growth in, um, in right-wing activities and in right-wing protests led by some of our politicians. Um, with, and so that some of you might have been following the pantomime that is Britain leaving the European Union um, that has been um, mobilizing its same forces. Those forces are being exploited through the pandemic. And at the same time, we, the, our government is able to do all sorts of things because people aren't watching. So we have a shift in, um, in government processes and practices that has eroded social trust. Great erosion of social trust. So that the, coming back to the sense of purpose, the, the, the activities that we can do to try and build collective purpose, I think have to do with an underpinning of an ethic of care, an understanding of the interrelationship between people and the natural world. And I should say that in, in the cities in Britain, that has been one of the advantages of the um, pandemic in that vehicles have, for, or for some weeks, vehicles disappeared from our roads. So birds began to sing, animals came into the cities, the air pollution went right down. People became aware of their relationship with the natural world. Um, so those kinds of possibilities, I think, have to build on the solidarity, but across social groups, the um, possibilities for collective sense of purpose and connections with the natural world in all spheres of life, particularly in the economic sphere. And that raises all sorts of things about how we can work with people participatively to develop different kinds of employment opportunities, different kinds of work um, and way, ways in which people can live their livelihoods um, that are quite different from how they were before. So I think I share both the pessimism of the distress that people are in um, and we've had the highest number of deaths in Europe in Britain um, and probably the highest number of infections I think we can even beat Spain on this um, but I also share the optimism that of, of Moises that we can I suppose the way we think about it is thinking about resilience overcome adversity whilst changing sources of that adversity. That's it. Carolyn, I think that, I think it would be, it's like you said, we have to do an analysis that the pandemic has strengthened inequality, has actually heightened it, and it's made it more visible. But I also understand that the visibility of inequality is creating, I think, relations of solidarity amongst classes. Like, like it, the inequalities and the violences is actually showing them. And I think we do have the potential to try to see how our relationship with the earth is, as Jenny said, what potentials exist. I remember very well that here in Brazil, there is a perspective of resistance, more than resilience. There's more resistance than resilience. This would be a fight to confront inequality. There is a comprehension that, for example, the groups of populations that were used to be slaves that faced that fled from the colonial systems and they created new cultures with the ethics of cares with solidarity and that continue today because the black populations the indigenous populations have always been in violence situations 
in colonial perspectives, the populations that are not in the norm or the pattern of truth and power are always in a historical pandemic and have always been there. And I remember of Fanon when Fanon says that love and affection is the path for social change, but anger is too, is also questioning the system, indignation, fight, violence to also break social structures that are maintained because who is in power? They don't want to leave that power. They never want to release their power. The elite wants to stay there. The middle class, uh, I mean, the, the, the upper class doesn't want to lose their privileges. And there's a very smart group of people, politicians that are populists, the extreme right, which is growing. When there's a perspective of strengthening groups, but the nationalistic groups or populist groups that try to create hierarchies that are stronger amongst themselves. It's like, this is a moment which is very difficult. It's a paradox, really. It's like it's a point in time. I'm not sure. For me, a new, a very strong moment is coming. I think we can bring in change now, but we have to change strategically speaking, knowing that we have virtualness and care, but the poorest population doesn't have the same care that we have. They don't have virtual tools like we have. So how can we have processes for social change and all social classes, which is precisely the poorest classes, which are in historical violence for pandemics, but I really don't know what the solution is. I'm still trying to find the solution. We're all, each of us, trying to find the solution. Thank you, James. Thank you. Max had asked for the word, then Irma. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Max, I'm from Chile. I'm in Santiago, it's 7.30 p.m. They've mentioned quite a bit, very interesting things that have really happened in Chile. In Chile, we had a mixture of processes, social revolt ever since October that was mixed with the pandemic. There's two processes, a part of a sanitary crisis, we have a very important social crisis. And there has been different answers, different responses. And and, and about our new constitution, and there's been many different political things. So I would like to talk about what Jenny was talking about, about things that communities themselves, about the lack of response from the state as a response in order to support themselves in Chile. At least in Santiago, in the peripheral neighborhoods, we had the common territories where what, what Moses mentioned, those people that could not leave went to go buy things for the older adults. Or So we did have some solidarity, even though the state is not doing things. The base communities with certain experience and his, their historical perspectives, they do have their own resources to try to get ahead. And at the same time, the state has actually not generated adequate policies for local realities. And, and for example, there's a sector in quarantine where places where people buy and sell food. Did you want to say something, Jorge? No, no, no. No, keep going. They worked. You saw a lot of people there. So actually, it was actually a risk for contagion or infection. People continued. And the positive things that I wanted to mention from this quarantine that has worked very individualistically, but also collectively speaking, and has been on social media, is there's a greater worry for self-care and personal development as well. Many people have begun to work on mindfulness and meditation, developing new hobbies. They were actually forced into it, many of them, due to the enclosure, which is something relevant and which is positive. And also, teleworking it has also revolutionized the way in which we work, especially thinking about cases. Uh, I, I met a guy from a call center. Call centers had connections where they used to travel and they had very long work days. Now they're, they're working from home. And now they're with their families. 
So they have much better conditions than what they had in the previous life in the call center. And I also wanted to react to what Moises said because I work in a, in a university as well. And in this first phase where we all started to face our self in a virtual world, not only do, do the institutional practices from the university, that we make decisions about how to work with our students, but the professors themselves had to start to have domestic roles in their homes, just like some students had to do so themselves as well. So there was also some sort of sensitivity and solidarity and empathy in terms of everyone, what everyone was doing. The professors probably had the same thing is happening to professors. So it was very interesting because it levels the uh, asymmetry or the playing field and in the conditions. That's a little bit of a summary of what different people said. And that's what I really caught my attention. Thank you very much, Max. Irma? I, I wanted to refer a little bit about the pandemic and work based on the comment of Carolyn and, and uh, Max's comment. I think that one of the immediate impacts is the increase of the unemployment rate, particularly in the uh, impoverished communities in the, in the different areas. So, and um, there is a huge uh, potential of exploitation, and I, and I th I th I'm thinking about the un the universities, where it will be possible to add more, more students to the class sessions because the classroom is not becoming a limit in terms of the number of people you can fit there. I can bring more and more people and, and pay the same fee to the teacher, and the professor and exploit the the, the professor. And I'm also concerned about, the, at the university level, the community and the faculty, the teaching community. How is it that we can uh, change our shifts? Because this is time consuming when you need to change, uh, change the, the period. The whole process has become uh, uh, weaker on the other hand, uh, to talk about the positive part, that in, in Puerto Rico, for example, I, I forgot uh, to say that I'm in Puerto Rico and it's already 6.40 p.m. In Puerto Rico, for example, there has been an increase of entrepreneurship and self-management. People who are invent making up their own businesses from home they're selling food, they're creating new products. So, or people who ended up without a job and, and now they have a job, as Max indicated, because they're at home to, to do things that are different. So I think that the impact of the pandemic on the working life, I think it, it deserves a lot of analysis and, and should be given some thought. Thank you, Irma. Corgelina. I was thinking um, about a few things, especially when Jenny was talking about the uh, talking about resilience. When when Jen uh, spoke about resistance, and uh, and I'm, I'm thinking about re-existence. That will be a new word. So I'm I'm. I'm thinking about how can we create new um, ways to re-exist. I think uh, that it will be good to think about the three categories without uh, them being inclusive. Because when we were talking uh, about uh, when Carolyn was indicating that, uh, there, that we have no sufficient classes, I think that uh, actually, there was a comment on on the on the anger that was taken by the um, by the right wing, and this is a phenomenon that is actually moving um, the different processes. So 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 this is um, uh, being addressed by the most conservative sector. So and I think so. I don't know if this is an optimistic dimension or or if uh, we are experiencing both, both things. So another challenge that we have, not only in terms of the new topics that we, or the, what Irma mentioned, uh, the impact of work and uh, the, your life, 
and the and the impact that you will have with the different uh, uh, processes. It's it's a matter of re-existing as a as a as a discipline. So I think that this requires thinking about other epistemologies, epistemologies that uh, will not longer think on as black or white. Because at least in the context of uh, Argentina, or the things that you hear, uh, the, these are uh, practices that are uh, creating solidarity practices, uh, taking care of some people. Those are the ones who are attacking others who cannot do the isolation. So this, this is a positive or negative solidarity. So I think uh, that this requires thinking about other types of uh, categories. And uh, in, now in terms of the impacts with respect to the pandemic impacts, in my opinion, you know, that I do, that I work, I study and I'm an activist in aspects related to, to the houseless or to the homeless population and things related to the use of public space. And I think that there's another impact. Public space, there's a huge transformation in, on the use of public space and it also requires a review in the categories. On the one hand, while well, well, there was isolation or quarantine that was quite restrictive, some people ended up very isolated in the public space uh, and, and, and they spent the time on the public space and they're always there. So this has uh, given rise to conflicts in the community life and their social life. And now that the, the spaces are open, at least in Argentina and many countries, just like in Europe, they're thinking about closing. And we're thinking about the opening. So those who cannot go to the, to the private places because, uh, that, because uh, due to care, you need to use the public space, they're going to use the public space that they were not using, which had other purposes for those who usually uh, use that. So for example, a square or a park, you see the homeless people with those who have a place to stay and, and they are, they're creating a, conf a conflict. So this is, another, this is some more food for thought where we need to look into the categories that we had as discipline and we need to address other categories. Rodrigo, just a comment uh, in terms of what we're discussing. Because we were I mentioned that in Spain in the last year, the street has been has been uh, taken by the extreme right wing. Manifestations are are being carried out by the extreme uh, right wing, which is quite which is booming in in um, Spain. Uh, thank you. Just uh, based on what Jorgelina said last, there is a common place. of um, a lot of uh, countries we have uh, the new normality so and um, this is a concept which may be dangerous as community psychologists or and perhaps uh, Adding some language nomenclatures can give rise to different situations. So the normality is, is, is implies, a, implies a risk and uh, therefore, so uh, based on uh, what Lejono said, how can we think, uh, rethink and re, uh, re-address or re-plan uh, different uh, elements to give rise to criticism. So there are certain things that that could be actually scary in my case because the networks of solidarity among the lower uh, levels or, or the socio, socio, lower socioeconomic levels in, in the cities, I think I would say that in Latin America, they have been situations where a lot of lower layers are really used to, up, to living that way. Why is this scary for me? Because the reading that we are doing, um, this, can, this can lead to, to the 
uh, to a different approach and a different practices. When we when we are saying that people are are hardly surviving, and when we read that this is resistance, then uh, then perhaps we're we're doing this from the uh, from the academy or or from a specific community. So the situation there is how is it that we can withstand certain elements which are really complicated to survive. As Alicia mentioned a few minutes ago, what seems to be very clear, and there's an article that I read, which is very interesting. How is it uh, that how is it that uh, being greedy as variable could had uh, appeared as one of the important elements after analyzing the pandemic, which where there was more complication with respect to, to those who were governing the different places. Talking about US, England, Brazil, in the case of Spain, perhaps Madrid and Chile, where we have different uh, common factors in terms of the government, where, where we is a lot of situation and the same applies to the situation in the US, and there are other governments and states which have not been present. So I would really like to um, specify this, this aspect. I don't know if the concept there, uh, perhaps I don't know if I, I may go, be going against uh, the, the flow, but, but we need to be uh, critical in this case because when we standardize things, uh, I, I really uh, get scared and, and I re I'd rather live in, if I think that things are becoming really uh, comfortable, uh, it's scary. So the indifference of the state, and this is a question that, that we normally have on top of our heads, is, is the state so important or, or, uh, do, or uh, should the, the communities be more important in, term, in terms of the state? So that's basically it uh, in order not to go further. Thank you, Rodrigo. Alicia, the word is yours. Simply something very brief, because I think people have been reading my mind With the last things that was proposed and Jorge Lina said and Rodrigo said, I was thinking a little bit about the same thing about this related to how do we accept that what we're inhabiting are contradictions? How do we accept or inhabit contradictions? And then within this framework, I'm very pessimistic. Let's say that I am very pessimistic. I am very pessimistic. Having said that, I'm going to criticize the notion of pessimism and optimism because I think the notion of pessimism and optimism places us in a future time. An undetermined amount of time, it would seem like there's something outside of us. There's something like when we say optimism or optimism or pessimism, there's something, there's a supposition that there's a change that's going to happen independent, that something's going to happen independent of us. So I think in this same line of rethinking certain categories within community psychology, I believe that the notion of time with, and without the, a doubt that the notion of temporality and without a doubt the notion of social change is very linked to this. I think that it's fundamental I think the issue is more like, like what place has the present? We have to make things present, pre presentify, if that's a word, but not in a sense, not in the sense, sometimes when we say micro policies or the changes that we can make in daily life would seem that there's a certain conformism. And no, I think that it's how do we change our look on temporality? And in that sense, there's something that I am. It's not something that's coming. It's what am I and what am I doing? Not what's coming because the construction of the common and the collective is something that is that I'm doing that is happening that is contingent. 
so I want to invite everybody to rethink social change, transformation, and how the time dimension plays a role here. Thank you, Alicia. I don't think anybody else asked uh, to speak. If I forgot someone, we still have five minutes left uh, to close the session. I'm not sure if anybody that has not participated wants to give an opinion or wants to share an idea or a question or anything. Ruben is sharing his sound. That's a threat. No, uh, Gabriela asked for the words. Gabriela, please go ahead. Forgive me, Gabriela. Good to see you. Hello. Um, we'll add the music later once we have our shared ideas. I like the music. <laughs> um, it's actually, um, I'm in Australia, Melbourne. It's almost 10 a.m. So it was fun actually hearing the music. It helped me wake up. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I guess I just wanted to add um, onto what a few people said. Um, firstly, with um, Max, I've also noticed um, that social media because everybody's at home and we can't connect in real life. Social media has been a really big um, advocacy tool um, for different communities during this time, um, especially those that are mostly disadvantaged, like um, people living in um, a commission, like housing estates. Um, there's been some kind of um, extra, there was a period where there was um, enforced you know a severe restriction on their movements and during that time the community really mobilized through social media and you know the whole there was people on the ground but then because of social media they were able to inform everybody else what they needed and so um, people donated food people um, it was a lot of fundraising um, so a lot of monetary support as well and I found that you know even with um, the Black Lives Matter movement, the Ab Aboriginal community here has been able to highlight what's been happening here in terms of Black deaths in custody. And so, um, again, people have been able to support them through um, whether it's signing petitions or donating to different um, organisations and community groups to support um, the things that they need or want to do to support their communities and um, to raise their voices and so social media has been able to um, amplify the information that they want to spread um, and also in terms of the relationship between like the community and the state because yeah the state has sort of um, there is they're very slow in acting the community has actually um, been a lot quicker in, in um, organizing and um, it's just shown the, the strength of the community and the connections. I think the connections have been strengthened during this time um, and people have been willing to um, support and to do what they can to support the, the people working on the ground directly with their communities. And, um, uh, and I think that the challenge has been to how do how do we continue this um, these so these actions of solidarity? Um, it's it's kind of you know sometimes it can be a big burst of energy from everybody, and then after a week or two, once things have settled, once you know there's been um, the major like the crisis has is sort of over. Um, there that sort of drops that that level of um, energy and momentum so um, I think that's that's been the challenge and it's been I think um, th there has been though like more even action between the community and the state people you know are sending out like you know template letters like contact information for your local like a, um, in, like member of parliament um, you know phone numbers for politicians like contact these people send them letters and so there has been I think more awareness of um, just basically the access you know between the community members and the government you know we can actually directly talk to them and let them know and I think maybe that on that level like it hasn't been 
as um, as well known how, how we can actually directly impact through petitions and, and things like that. So um, I think there's been more activity in terms of the relationship between community and state. But again, sometimes the community has been um, actually better at and quicker at organizing because on social media, it's just immediate. Everybody gets the information, they spread it, they donate, they sign petitions, you know, they do all of that. And um, I think it's been amazing, but I think the challenge is to be able to continue that level of support and action. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela. Well, I think that before we leave, before we leave each and every one of us, first of all, I wanted to thank you for having shared this space with us. I think that it shows the small, the small scale of this window shows us that we need spaces to share and that these conferences have to be, we have to build spaces where we can actually share maybe a bit more organized than what we were today and maybe with a better dynamizer than me or better host than me with the words, but, but these spaces are missing to be able to share and to be able to dance and to be able to dance. If that's evident. Georgina, you wanted to say something? You, that you've been doing fundamentally? I'm muted. You're muted, Jorgelina. She's muted. It's a Uruguayan way of saying muted. They, they said muteada, which is muted. They, so here we see a few ideas. We can share this with you that we started to jot down while we were speaking. It's a way to actually see that use it as you want i'll send you the link to the music via the chat room and each of you can use it so thank you to everyone but this is what we wrote the notes we took during the event take care of yourselves goodbye <laughs>